Welcome Life Changers Church, Global Church family to Moments. So excited to be here with you tonight and get to study the word together. Tonight is all about getting discipled, growing, and momentum's an interesting thing to me. Like, I'm a sports fanatic, so it's, it's always fun to watch a sports team a little bit of momentum. They could be down and out, but just a little momentum. And in that fourth quarter, it changes the trajectory of the game and all of a sudden they're winning, right? I believe that as we study the word tonight with our pastor, there could be one word, one thing that he says, one nugget, one scripture that just totally changes course for you in your life. So believe that with me and just get your Bible out, get your notebook out, lean in tonight to the word and let's believe God for transformation from this night forward in all of our lives together. I believe he's gonna do that for us. Hey, I wanna take a minute before we get into the word, I wanna thank every single person watching right now, everyone connected to our church family. Thank you for being so faithful to give, to partner with us, to connect with us in that manner. Everything we're able to do around the country, around the world as a global church family, it happens because we do it together. We give, we, we tithe, we support with our faith. And I just wanna thank you so much because we are doing awesome stuff all around the world, partnering together. You know, when we give, it's love in action. God is love and love gave, right? And so the reflex of love is giving. So thanks for partnering with us. If you wanna to give tonight before we get into the word, just click the link on your screen or the link in the comments and you can go ahead and do that real quick. But hey, let's believe God for momentum tonight as we get into the word with our pastor. Again, lean in and let's believe for something phenomenal tonight. Welcome to Moments. I'm so excited about tonight's time together. I believe miracles happen in moments. So I want to encourage you to get a notebook out, get your Bible out. I'm going to go through some beautiful passages of Scripture just for you. And I want this to be like a one-on-one -on -one Bible study. But if you want to gather some friends or you're already gathered for maybe a watch party or you, you have your family with you, I want to have uh, some time to really study the Bible with you and go one-on-one -on -one about one because I want to talk about one. Well, the one we talk about, the one we worship, the one that we adore is the one that loved us first, right? And we're going to talk about Jesus. Everything in the Bible is all about Jesus. But I want to focus on a Bible study with you today called The Power of One Thing. The Power of One Thing. Now, there's actually going to be four or five things but they all stand alone as one thing. And if you go through the scriptures, you'll find basically four or five things that are mentioned by Jesus or by David as the one thing they're after, the one thing that we should be focusing on. Now, for the last couple of years, for the last year and a half or more, my focus has been on reprioritizing my life and 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 leading you to reprioritize yours as well around trusting God, trusting Jesus, to um, reimagine what church can be, to revive the simplicity of, our, of who we are in Christ, the simplicity of the finished work of the cross, the simplicity of God's love for us, the simplicity of the Bible summed up in one verse, is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Not only is the Bible summed up in that one verse, but really all of human history and human existence is summed up in that one verse. But that's not the one verse I want to talk to you about today, although <laughs> we could talk about that anytime and get revelation and feel the, love, the waves of God's love wash over our soul any and every time we go over that verse. But the power of one thing. So we're talking about simplicity. So I want to talk to you. First thing I want to talk to you about the one thing. I want to talk to you about the one thing that we need to know. The one thing I know. That's mentioned in the Bible. One thing I know. The passage is in John chapter 9, verse 25. I'm reading out of the New King James Bible, and I go out of the Living Bible sometimes, and out of various different translations. So I got some translations in on the pages, and I got some translations on my computer as well, and I encourage both. Read, the, read God's Word online. Read God's Word in the book 
just read God's word and believe God's word, more importantly. One thing I know, John 9, verse 25 in the New King James Bible, he, remember this is when the man that was born blind was healed by Jesus and the Pharisees, they were you know, kind of upset that he was healed and they tried to shame him because he had no education and they tried to shame him because they didn't want to admit that a miracle had happened in this man's life. The devil always tries to shame us, to try to, to, try to uh, get us to stop believing, to shame us into being condemned, to shame us into feeling um, guilty. He wants, the devil is a shamer and Jesus is the opposite of that. He takes the shame upon himself so you can be not guilty and feel the peace of God. But so this blind man gets healed and they said, they said, tell us about this man. Who was it that healed you? And he's a sinner. He can't be, he can't have healed you. And this is what the blind man said. Now he's the seeing man, right? <laughs> let's not, let's not uh, attach a past version of us to our present condition, to our present, the present version of us. So this seeing man who was once blind said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. But one thing I know, one thing I know, once I was blind and now I see. So I want us to really zero in on one thing to know. You know, there's a lot of knowledge in this world. There's a vast amount of knowledge. Knowledge increases every day and our ability to access knowledge and access information is greater than it's ever been before. But with all the knowledge that is in this world, this man who was blind, who got healed, said something so profound, it, we need to stop, we need to double click on it, and we need, to, we need to make this our life theme about knowledge and about what we should know. Because he said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. Like, my responsibility in this life does not include determining whether somebody's a sinner or not. My responsibility in this life is not based on my view of you, my view of somebody else. He said, it's not my problem whether he's a sinner or not. That's not my... That's not my interest. That's not my knowledge base. But one thing I know, I once was blind and now I see. One thing I know, I once was blind and now I see. I want you to think about that. One thing I know, this is what I was, this is what I am. This is who I was, this is who I am. It's really a very powerful thought and a concept. We could spend the whole time of moments on this one thing. One thing I know. One thing I know, this is what I was, this is what I am. This is who I was, this is who I am. If we can get a hold of that, that it's not complicated. It's not, we don't have to know everything. We simply need to know what we were and know what we are. We were lost and now we're found. We were condemned and now we're not guilty. We were cursed, and now we're blessed. I once was a hater, now I'm a lover. I once was afraid, now I have faith. I once was a doubter, now I'm a believer. I once was worried, now I'm at peace. This one thing I know. When it comes to knowledge, you know, you can have a million books on your shelf. When it comes to knowledge, you could have the information and data about everything in the world, but nothing is really going to change your life more than knowing what you were and knowing what God's done in your life now. I once was blind, now I see. I don't know about all that. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know about all that. That's not my... That's not my... That's, that's, that's not my focus in life. That's not my expertise judging people. 
My expertise is what I was and now what I am. My expertise, my expertise is the experience of knowing what I once was and knowing what I now am. It's the power of one thing. One thing I know. Don't seek knowledge to just have information to impress anybody. The one thing you need to know, the one thing that needs to be, that you need to know more than anything else is who you were compared to who you now are. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away and all things have become new. We don't need to complicate this walk with God, this relationship with God. We once were one thing and now we're something else. One thing I know. The second one thing, I know it's contradictory, right? I'm talking about one thing, but now I'm on the second one thing. One thing I ask. There's one thing I know. This is what I was. This is what I am. One thing I ask. One thing I ask. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold his beauty, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. One thing I have asked, one thing I have asked that I shall seek. One thing, one thing to ask, one thing to seek. I love the message translation of this verse. I'm asking God for one thing only, one thing, to live with him in his house my whole life long. I'll contemplate his beauty and I'll study at his feet. Well, that's what we're doing right now. I'm asking God for one thing. You see, I know that there are many things we, we want or need in life, but there's one thing that David said that he was asking from God. One thing I have asked from the Lord. This should be the most important thing. The most important thing to know is who you are, what you were and who you are, what you were and what you are now, who you were, who you are now. Most important thing to know, the greatest knowledge is knowing who you are. The power of knowing who you are, oh, we'll drill down on that another time, but this one thing I asked, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And what is he what does David had a taste of that he wants to see all the days of his life? He says, to behold the beauty of the Lord. The beauty of God, all beauty starts from God. Beauty is an, the overflow of who God is. It's not like there's beauty and then there's God. All beauty came from God. And once you know, once you've caught a glimpse of Jesus, it's impossible not to love him. Once you, once you catch a glimpse of his beauty, it's impossible not to love him. That's why when the Bible says all things work together for good to those that love him, you know, you don't need to love God more. You just need to see more of his beauty and that will cause you to love him more. It will, it, loving God is the effect. In life, there's cause and effect. Loving God is the effect of beholding his beauty. When you see how beautiful he is, you can't help but to love him. It's impossible not to fall in love with Jesus. It's not like, well, Jesus is, you know, Jesus is really compat compatible with Americans, but he's not compatible with Asians, or he's not compatible with Indians. That's a lie. Jesus is the most compatible human being, the most compatible being to every human being in the universe. We were all, we will all fall in love with him. Even those who perish will perish loving him, but it will be too late. Because once they see how beautiful he is, how just he is, how gracious he is, how kind he is, they will love him because it's impossible not to. Boy, that's another topic for another day. But one thing I ask, what should be our ambition in life? What should be our pursuit in life? The beauty of the Lord. Communing with, with Jesus, communing with God. One thing 
I know who I was, who I am. One thing I ask that I may dwell in his house forever all the days of my life to what? Behold his beauty and meditate in his temple and study at his feet. Whew. How about this one? This one's interesting, but I really want to focus on one part of this verse. Mark 10, 20. One thing we lack. One thing we lack. Now, doesn't the Bible say the Lord is my shepherd? I shall not want. I shall not lack. And it's true. It is true. Mark 10, 20. But Jesus had found this man that said, what must I do to, to have eternal life? This man comes up, this young man comes up to Jesus. What, what must I do to, to have eternal life? He said, follow the commands, you know. Love your neighbor, love God, you know. And the man says, I've done all those things. I've, he, he, I think Jesus also said, you know, obey your parents. The kid says, I've done all those things since I was young. What am I lacking? All these things I've kept since I was young, Mark 10, verse 20. And then in verse 21, the New King James Bible, then Jesus looking at him, loved him. Jesus looking at him, loved him. And said to him, one thing you lack, go, and, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. Now we know, for those who've read this passage, you know, the Bible says when, the, when Jesus said this to this man, he, he turned away and walked away grieved. He walked away in grief because he was more attached to the things he had than the things that God wanted to give him and the things that God wanted to do in his life. One thing you lack, he told him. You see, it wasn't that this man, in order to be saved, he's got to give to the poor. He's not talking about having a place in heaven. He's talking about having treasure in heaven. He's not talking about making it into heaven. He's talking about this will create treasure in heaven. So... We only get to heaven by the grace of God. By grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not a result of works as anyone should boast, right? He says in um, Ephesians 2.8, but Jesus is talking about what kind of reward is waiting for you in heaven if you can fall out of love with your possessions. You know, Jesus was giving this man an opportunity to love something else. This man was in love with his possessions. You know, there are a lot of people that are in love with their possessions. They don't, they don't say, it's not an emotion. They don't necessarily say, oh, I love, I love my money. I love my this, my that. Um, but it's to be attached. The word love means to be so attached to something that you don't want to let it go. You don't want to let go of it. You're attached to it. You need it too much. And Jesus was giving him something else to attach himself to. One thing he lacked was he lacked love. Because Jesus looked at him and the Bible says he loved him. And then said to him, one thing you lack. I love you. There's one thing you lack. It's that you love your things more than you've allowed the reality of my love to sink into your life. Jesus loved him. Jesus loves you. And he's giving you an opportunity to fall out of love with your possessions and fall in love with him. You see, this young man could not love God back. He couldn't love Jesus back until Jesus loved him first. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. So in verse 21, Jesus looking at him, loved him. What a beautiful word. He loved him. It's a, it's a present participle. He's, he loved him. He was, it's a past and it's a present. He loved him in the, as in previously, and he loved him at that moment. And he's loving him in that moment. And he's giving him an opportunity to reflex love back by attaching himself to something new. This young man had an opportunity to attach, attach himself to Jesus. That's love. But he was too attached to his possessions. And that's why Jesus said, I'm, the one thing you lack, in case, just because you're the one that asked, 
if you want to truly be free from loving your possessions, I'm giving you something better to love, me. And you'll lose your, your worldly affection for things. There's nothing wrong with having things. It's just being willing to let them go is where God wants us to be in our lives. Being willing to give, that's, how God, that's who God is. God so loved the world that he gave. Generosity is the mark of being touched by God. Generosity is the mark of being touched by God. Generosity is the evidence of being touched by God's love. Generosity is the proof that God's love has hit you right in the heart. One thing you lack. It wasn't, like he said, I did all these things, Lord. We got to stop trying to impress God with all the things we've done and simply focus on the one thing that we didn't do, not sinful things. I'm not talking about that. The one thing that matters to God is surrender. Surrender. God can do anything in your life when, when you're surrendered. That means you're trusting God with what you have. That means there's nothing in your life that you're not willing to let go of because your love for Jesus is so much more powerful than your love for things. And our love for people should be more powerful than our love for things. That's why we should give. That's why we should tithe. That's why we should honor God. That's why we should be generous because we love people more than things. We, more, we love people more than our possessions. And then when we give, we're making a way. We're giving people a chance to be saved. We're giving people a chance to, to be delivered, to be healed, to be introduced to the real Jesus to be introduced to their true worth, to be introduced to mindsets, changing the mindsets that will change their world. One thing I know, one thing I ask, one thing we lack, one thing that is necessary, this is the fourth thing, one thing that is necessary, the fourth one thing, right? <laughs> Luke 10, 41 and 42 New American Standard Bible. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by so many things. That word distracted is troubled, bothered, carried around, dragged around by life's circumstances. Literally, that word distracted, dragged around by life's circumstances. Like you're just being dragged around life's trouble is dragging you around. Life's trouble is controlling you. And he's saying how to break it. One thing is necessary. So he says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by so many things, but only one thing is necessary. Verse 42 says, only one thing that is necessary for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So this fourth thing is the one thing that is necessary. One thing that is necessary in our lives. It really goes with the second thing, one thing I will ask. It's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Mary chose to listen to Jesus, to sit and listen and let the love of God drip from the lips of her Savior, Jesus. One thing is necessary. We think so many things are necessary. We think everything in life puts an equal demand on our lives, and really there's only one thing that's necessary. Other things might be important, and if something's important, we need to give attention to the things that are important, like people in our lives. But one thing that is absolutely necessary if you're going to live in this world without worry and without anxiety and without questioning God, why don't you care? Why isn't my sister helping me? Why do I have to do why, why, why? The victim mindset. If you, the one thing that is necessary to be, to be delivered from that victim mentality, the one thing that is necessary to be delivered from that, the control of worry and the control of anxiety and the control of, of, of people bothering you, it bothered, it bothered Martha that Mary wasn't doing what Martha thought she should be doing. Isn't it funny how we know 
what other people should be doing more than we know how, how we, we know more about what other people should be doing than we know about what we should be doing in our lives. And one thing is necessary that Jesus said to sit at his feet. Mary has chosen the good part. Mary has chosen the good thing. And that thing that she chose to listen to God, to listen to the words of Jesus, it's not going to be taken from her. You know, whatever you listen to God about will never be taken from you. Listen to what God has to say about you, how much he loves you. It will never be taken away from you. If you will listen, lean in to listen. Remember, John leaned into the bosom of Jesus, leaning up against the bosom of Jesus. And there Jesus told John what Peter didn't even know and what the other disciples didn't know. Jesus whispers and really says to, to John, the one who dips his bread in this sop with me, that's the one that's going to betray me. It was leaning in to Jesus that caused John to hear something that nobody else heard. It was the leaning in to Jesus that caused John to survive something that nobody else could survive. It was John leaning in to Jesus that caused John to be fearless at the foot of the cross, fearless on the island of Patmos, where the book of Revelation was given to him. <laughs> he wrote the book of Revelation when they tried to ditch him to a deserted island, thought, we'll shut this guy up, put him on an island where nobody lives. And what did he do? He got louder than ever. And he wrote a book that everybody's heard of called the book of Revelation. Wow. One thing is necessary. Let's lean in. Let's lean in. You know, I want to also encourage you, studying the Bible and reading Scripture was meant to be done in community. It was meant to be done in community. I'm not saying that the Bible's not meant to be studied by yourself and pray, have time between you and the Lord. That's beautiful and that's precious. But the Bible wasn't written just for that. It was written, God gave us his word to be read and to be talked about and to be communed over with a body of believers. That was God's will. Emmanuel was never meant to be God with you. He was meant to be God with us. It doesn't mean he's not God with you. Of course he is. But the concept that God lays out from the beginning, from Genesis, let us make man in our image. God is a communer. God is about community. God is about better together. God is about let us. God is about God being with us. He's about us. He's about us. Let us arise and build. Let us. You see, the scripture is so clear. Every letter that was written was meant to be read in the gathering of the saints, in the gathering of the believers. And it wasn't meant to just be read alone. And in fact, the believers never had. The New Testament believers, the New Covenant believers, they never had all the scriptures that we have. But what they had was they had letters that were to be read in front of everybody and communed over, talked about, prayed about, developed in community. You can't walk out this life of a believer by yourself. It's meant to be something that you do with others. That's why this, this time together, this moment together is so powerful. That's why being able to gather in person and online is so powerful for churches everywhere. And that's why Sunday we'll be back in the house and online, in, both in the temple and from house to house, because that's God's way. That's God's pattern. There's something powerful about communing with each other and studying God's word in community. That's what a life group is all about. Get, get connected to one or start one. That's what watch parties are all about. Get connected to one or start one. All right, one final one thing. So we have one thing that I know. This is what I was. This is what I am. This is who I was. This is who I am. You need to know who you are more than you know anything else. One thing I ask 
from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty, to see the beauty of Jesus and meditate in his temple. I'll contemplate his beauty. I'll study at his feet. And he says, I'll live with him in his house. There's others that live in his house too. So get used to being connected because it's powerful power. It doesn't mean get, get, all the, get all the junk out of your life so that, you, so that you can then be qualified to be a part of a church. Everybody in a church has junk in their life. Everybody in a church, everybody on the earth has skeletons in their closet. Just let go of that fear or worry about being exposed because let me tell you what we should do for each other as the body of Christ. We cover one another. We don't expose one another. We cover our brothers and our sisters. We expose the devil. We cover each other. That's how to walk together. Well, there's one thing I know, one thing I ask, one thing I lack, surrender. One thing you might lack, surrender. It's not about what you do for God, but it's about surrendering your thought life, surrendering your opinion of the matter and accepting God's opinion of the matter, which is always better than our opinion. And one thing that is necessary, and finally, one thing that I do. This is a very powerful truth from Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Brothers and sisters, New American Standard is what I'm reading out of in this one. I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet, but one thing I do, he's talking about like the ultimate achievement and fulfillment of God's perfect will for his life. I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet, but one thing I do, one thing, one thing, one thing, get that, one thing. Be a specialist in one thing. One thing I do, he says, then he says three things really. So it's kind of funny, it's kind of ironic, but it's just God's tongue in cheek as well. It's kind of a sense of humor as well as uh, one thing can always be divided into easy steps. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead and pressing on toward the upward call of God that is in Christ Jesus. Think about that. The one thing I do, Paul said. So when it comes to doing, everybody wants to know, Lord, what am I supposed to do? Here's one thing to be focused on doing. One thing I do, forget what lies behind. Stop being limited by your past. Stop being defined by your past. Stop even, you know, leaning on your past for the good things that you've done and, 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 and resting easy on I, I've done enough. Like, it's not about what you've done in the past. It's about what you do with what you know right now. Forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting. Forget it. Let it go. Let go of regrets. Let go of your pain. Let go of your mistakes. Let go of what people have done to you. Forgetting what lies behind. Let go of what you've done. Let go of your mistakes. Let go of what's limited you. Reaching forward, he says, to what lies ahead. So forgetting, reaching to what lies ahead, there's so much good ahead of you and ahead for you and pressing on towards the goal of the, the prize for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, you're going to get to heaven by the grace of God, but let's press on when we feel stuck. Let's press on when it's hard. Let's press on when all of the lies that are, we're he hearing in our head are trying to keep us paralyzed to our past, paralyzed to our inferiority, paralyzed to our insecurities, paralyzed to our mistakes, paralyzed by those things, and held and chained to those things. He said, man, press on to the upward call. God's call to you is always going up. It's always going up. He's always taking you up higher. And it's a prize. Salvation is a gift. But that, that call of God is a choice to forget what lies behind, to reach to what lies ahead, and to press on no matter what comes against you. This one thing I do. It's one thing I know. It's one thing I I ask, it's one thing I lack, one thing that's necessary, one thing I do. If we can focus, 
maybe focus on one of those things each day next week, Monday through Friday. <laughs> maybe try each one of those and focus on that. But it's just a little play on words to give you a more focused look at how simple the victorious Christian life really is. Well, maybe you're here watching right now and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. What a great moment to have that all of heaven is looking down and all of heaven is silent and all of heaven is hoping and all of heaven is ready to cheer for you the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. If you haven't done that, can I pray with you? Would you just take a moment and pray with me? I'm going to just pray, lead you in the simple prayer out loud. The difference between heaven and hell is a person, Jesus. By accepting him, he's the bridge. He's the ladder to heaven. He's the bridge to eternal life. Just pray this, Heavenly Father. Just pray this out loud, Heavenly Father. I invite Jesus Christ into my life as my Savior and Lord. I believe, say that out loud, I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. From this moment forward, I'm a child of God. Pray this, Father, I believe the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin in Jesus' name. Boy, it's that simple. That's how simple being born again is. That's how simple being saved is. Growing and maturing, a little bit more of a process, <laughs> a lot more of a process, but process that produces progress. But it starts with the simple gift of salvation by receiving that free gift of eternal life. Congratulations if you did. There should be a link on your screen to the book that we have available for you for free, The Power of a New Life. You can download it anywhere in the world, grab a hold of your copy and stay connected. And let me know you prayed. Let me know that you, what God spoke to you through this message. All of you, let me know. And I'll see you on Sunday. I can't wait to worship Jesus with you then. God bless. Thanks again for joining us tonight for Moments. Momentum for your life is happening tonight. You guys are awesome. So blessed to just be able to connect with you in this way as a church family. Let's stay connected. Let's further connect. You know, uh, our podcast is an awesome way to go from here. If you want to subscribe to our podcast, you can re-listen to tonight's message and thoughts and so many more things. So the links on your screen right now are in the comments. You can uh, connect with us on our podcast. Also, just want to let everyone know, August 22nd, our city campus is relaunching. And part of that experience at our 1030 service in person, we are going to be giving away 750 backpacks to kids in need going back to school this fall. So cool that we get to do this together. More info is on your screen if you want to be a part of that or check out what we're doing. Or if you're in need of that, go to the link on your screen and see what we're doing as a global church. You guys are God's best. We love you. Can't wait to see you this Sunday for Church Online. Have a great night.